so I, I understand from your RFP kind of your high level goals, you know, user, easy user interface, remote, GIS, document management, all the basics. Are there any key points that you're that you're really looking into or that you'd like to take an extra uh, closer look at or do you just want kind of a general overview? I say a general overview. We may have some questions at the end as far as letters and reports and things like that, but you'll probably cover that. All right. I'll kind of give you a general overview of everything. If I'm if I'm not giving you enough information or I'm giving you too much information, feel free to let me know. And sometimes when I'm talking, if you say something, I can't hear you. So if you're saying something and I'm babbling on, I may not hear you. So I'll try to take pauses just in case that happens. All right, so this is the main welcome page that as soon as you log into CitizenServe, you'll see. And you can log into CitizenServe you know, anywhere that you can get on the internet. So you can do it from the office, from the home, out in the field. We're iPad compatible, so if you're using iPads out in the field, that's been a, a, a good solution for a lot of our customers. You can get to the system, you know, as long as you can get on the internet, you'll be able to log in and have access to all of your information. So this welcome page, the first thing it lists here are your tasks. So based on your role, this might be different things. For your inspectors, your officers, these are primarily going to be your inspections and reinspections. So these pop up and remind you when you've got an inspection that's due. And the nice thing about these as inspections uh, inspectors is they stay on your list until you finish them. Um, sometimes if you calendar things, you put them on your calendar, but you were too busy that day, you didn't get to it, and then it kind of slips through the cracks and you, you, you forget about it. This will stay on your list until you finish it. So you can see I've got a couple on here, because I'm a terrible inspector, that have been here forever. They won't go away until I say, hey, I did this. So that helps you keep track of things and helps um, keep your cases from sort of falling through the cracks. If you've got appointment-based items, like maybe hearings, if you've got to go to a hearing, or if you've got scheduled inspections, more along the lines of a, uh, rental inspections if you're scheduling times, those will show up in your appointment section. And those are more date and uh, time specific, more like a calendar item. Over here, you've got just the recent files that you've been using. You can set up custom metrics. And metrics are just little pieces of information. Each user can have different ones. So as an inspection, uh, as an inspector, I might want to see, you know, how many overdue inspections do I have? Or how many open cases do I have? A manager might want to see what's our total number of open cases. So you can configure these and have, you can have up to five. And this is really kind of just a, a look into. Within your reports, you can have as much, you know, as many different types of reports as you want. And we'll look at that. But this is just kind of a quick view into those key metrics that you're looking at. So I'll start out by putting in a new case. And we'll kind of walk through how to, if someone calls up a complaint, or if you're an inspector and you're plugging in a proactive complaint, we'll walk through that and put it in. And then after we do that, we'll go through the inspection process. So to add a new complaint, I'm going to come up here to Add and select Code Compliance Case. The first thing I'm going to ask for is our citizen. This is if someone's calling it in and they want to give you their name. So if you know, Susie Smith calls you all the time, you can plug her information in. If it's something that's a proactive that you found while you're out in the field, or if it's a person who wants to remain anonymous, you can skip that part. So I'll skip that for now and just jump down here into our brief description. So let's just say that this can... Hey, hold on one second. Will, yes. uh, will that citizen name autofill if it's already in the system? It will. So if I, if I came in here and I said, you know, Julie Garvey, she's the person complaining, and I'll click search, if I'm already in there, then I'm listed, and I enter myself lots of times. But you just hit select, and then it'll pull in their information. So you can verify email, you can verify their phone number, and it automatically ties them to this case as the complainant. And we'll get into the people, because you can have lots of different people on a file, so this association helps you identify who everybody is. Thank you. And if this is a complaint that's entered through, through your website, or if you use our iPhone app, if these are complaints submitted by your citizens, then that information automatically comes in based on their registration. So I'll jump here. Let's say we've got some weeds and junk cars in the front yard, an always popular complaint. 
Now, if you want to add a note, so let's say you're talking to the complainant and you've got a 10-minute conversation about it and you want to put more details, you can put them in the note field. This brief description, it shows up on a lot of your reports, it shows up on your searches, so it's really just the one or maybe two sentence description. If you want to go in more depth, then you can plug in a note here. You don't have to, you can leave it blank. So next, I'm going to select an address. So I'm going to plug in one, oh, wrong field. I'm going to plug in 147 Baker. Let me get rid of my zip. And I'm going to click the search icon. Now there's a couple of ways you can look up property information. If you click the search icon, it's going to pull up your parcel database. And this comes from your, typically from the county assessor's office. And it's got the basic information, the address, the owner's name and mailing address, parcel number, legal description, things like that. So it'll show you up in this top section properties that were found within your parcel database. Below that, it shows you any cases that have been on that address. So sometimes you'll Someone will start out this case and they'll find out there's been an ownership change and they'll adjust it. So this is sort of historical, it helps you kind of see, well, what, what other history have we seen on this one? I'm going to just click Select All on this one. And that automatically pulls in our full address, the owner's name, parcel number, legal description, all that data we've got tied to that address. And if there happens to be an alert on the address, you get this flashing exclamation point. And this only shows up if there is an alert. So if you see that, you can click it. And then it'll just be whatever that narrative is. You can put alerts on properties. You can put alerts on people. And they're just a way to flag that, hey, there's something important going on here. This can show up on your inspection reports. The red exclamation point shows up all over the place once it's on there. So it's just a way for you to flag files. Another icon that may also appear is this one. And it's the other files icon. It only shows up if there's any sort of history on this address. So you can click this, and it'll just give you a list of all the cases or complaints that have come in on that address. So you, if there's more than one, they'd all be listed. And you can drill down if you want to. The other thing you can do with your address is click this Show It on a Map. And I'll click this. And let me drag my window over here. It pulls it up, shows it on the map, You know, gives us the same basic information. Again, if there's an alert, it shows up with a red icon. You can turn on different layers. So if you'd like to see the zoning or different you know, geographical information, you can do that. And I'll just close this, and it keeps the geographic information. So you can look it up in that list view that we initially did or in on the map, or you can look it up both ways if you'd like. So we can select our type. So we'll say it's a code enforcement file. I'll leave priority blank. Um, disposition is usually something that comes into place after you've closed it. And these, all of these drop-down fields you can customize. We set them up with your basic information initially, but you can always add, remove, change the items in there. I'll leave that blank for now. Um, the categories are similar to violations, but they're usually kind of a level higher. So on this one, I might just say it's nuisance. And this is used a lot for reports. And you can have multiple categories. So if they also had, you know, some pigs they weren't supposed to have. We could also mark it as a nuisance and an animal. And again, you can configure this list. So that's our basic information here. The next thing I'm going to do is schedule an inspection. Um, so to do that, it already is defaulting to an inspection and to our inspector. I'll just go over here and pick a start date of today. That's going to make it show up on his list today. So I'll click Save. And that sets up our case file, and it pulls up the file that it's created. It assigns an automatic file number, which is just a year and a sequential number. And it shows our case file. These tabs across, across the top let us view different information. So the history is kind of the basic information. It pulls in a picture. Um, you can either tie pictures to your addresses. If you don't have those, then it pulls it off of Google Maps. So it'll show you kind of what's, what do we have. If you've got something more accurate than a Google Map picture, we'll load those. If not, it'll give you a Google Map. And you can change this. So if your inspector goes out and does an inspection, he wants to have a different thumbnail, you can do that. Um, all your basic information is down here. Um, down in this section below, it'll list your notes. And it also has like an audit trail. So if I say look at complete history, it'll kind of give me a list of all the changes. So as you add notices or add activities or delete information, it all gets logged here in this complete history. Our contacts tab lets us view all the people associated with this complaint. So here I am as a complainant. 
you can add as many people as you want. So you can have tenants and landlords and property owners and previous property owners and banks and anyone who might be involved. You can add as many as you want. The Activities tab is going to list all of our activities, which is mostly inspections, but it can also be things like hearings or follow-ups and things like that. And again, you can add as many as you want. So if this is an ongoing case over time, you'll get a by-date history of everything that's happened. Our Documents tab, right now we don't have any documents, but once we start attaching photos and generating our letters, which I'll show you, those will all be listed here. And the Violations tab, again, we don't have any yet because we haven't done an inspection, but once we do inspections and we start finding violations, those will be listed here, and we can have as many of those as we want on the file as well. Our options over here let us um, add it, edit or add information. So that's kind of an overview of how you input a complaint and sort of the general navigation within the case file. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions on that part? Uh, Julie, I have a question. Um, you started by saying this is, like for us, that would be two different violations in one case. Uh, we can set that up to be independent violations from one another, like vehicles, one violation, lot, another violation, etc. Yes, you could put one to you know, hundreds of violations. Whatever you find on that property, you're going to put it on this one complaint, on this one file. So when you generate your letters, you send out one letter, typically, that contains all the violations, which I'll show you when we, when we kind of get to that part. But yeah, you can have as many violations as you need under this one case file. All right. What, what he's asking you is we have a separate ordinance for weedy lots and abandoned vehicles. We have to send two different letters. How would we do that? We would just set up two different types of letters. Let me show you. Let's plug in some inspection results, and then we'll get to the letter part, and I can show you kind of some of the different options there. Okay. All right, so let's pretend we're an inspector, and we're going to do an inspection. I'm going to click this logo, which takes me back to my welcome page with all of my information due. And here's our inspection. So we're going to pretend like we did this inspection. I'll start by just clicking right here. So let's say we went out, we took some pictures, we found some violations, and we're going to send them a notice of violation. So I'm going to plug in my inspection comments. I might just say, um, I don't know, inspection complete, violation found, send, something like that. I'm going to plug in the completion date here. This is what takes it off of my to-do list. It's not the completion date for the case, it's just the completion date for this individual inspection. My case is still going to stay open unless I close it. I plugged in this inspection. What I'm going to do now is schedule a follow-up or a re-inspection for myself to be reminded in a couple of weeks. So to do that, I just click this icon. And this time I'll say, oh, I'm going to do a re-inspection. And I want to go out in two weeks. And then I'll click Save. So if I look at my um, activities tab here, I've got two. Here's my first inspection that we know is done because it's got a completion date. And then this reinspection, which is blank, we know it hasn't been done and it's going to show up on our to-do list so we'll be reminded to do it. So that our inspections in there, let's say we took some pictures, we're going to add those. So to add those, I'm going to come over here under Add and select Document. And let's say we took some photos. Uh, I've got a weedy picture here, and what do I have, a nice pretty car, I like this car, we'll do those too. And sometimes those photo names are things like J-R-B-L-K and they don't make any sense, so in this description you can put in a narrative so that when you're looking at the list you can see them. And here I might put weeds. I'll click Save. This is going to pull them off of your camera or off of your computer and attach them here to the Documents tab. They're a permanent part of your CitizenServe file now. So if you delete them from your camera or you delete them from your um, computer, they're going to stay here and they're, you know, they're always there unless you remove them. If you want to drill down on any of them, you just can click the file name. And Okay, I live in Arizona and nothing is that green here. So that looks actually kind of cool to me. But, um, so you can look at all those pictures, and you can attach as many as you want. There's no limit on the number of photos you can attach. We don't track the amount of space that you use. We don't charge you extra for using up lots of space. You use whatever you need.
You can also attach other types of files, like Word documents. I have a customer who they record all of their hearings, and they attach the audio recording so that they have that history as well. So we've added our photos. Now let's note what violations we found. So to do that, I'm going to come over here under Add again and select Violation. And as part of your setup, we get all your ordinances, uh, and we put them in the system. And you can select it from the code if you actually know the section, and it'll pull in the description. If you don't know the code, you can pull it by the description, and it'll tie back and show you what the code is. If you click View, it'll show you well, what is that full text. So this is actually the ordinance text, and it's usually a paragraph or so. And this can print out on our notices, which I'll show you here in just a second. So let's say I'm going to plug in a comment here. This is the inspector's note. You can have this print on your letters as well. So if you're going to give them the actual ordinance, which is the legal sort of narrative, you may also want to put a specific note to make it easier for them to solve their issue. You don't have to, but you can. So I've got our weeds in here. I'm going to save this one, which saves it, gives me a blank page to add another one. So let's say we've also got um, a vehicle problem. I'll pick that one, you know, the rusty. And we'll add one more just for good measure. Let's say we also found, I don't know, some rodents. And I'll click Close here. So our Violation tab is going to list all of those violations that we attach to the file. You can have different dispositions for each one. So if you go out and do a reinspection and they took care of the weeds in the vehicle, but the rodents are still there, you could close these two, just keep this one open, and keep working the case. So you can track you know, days open for individual violations if you want. So we've added in all of our violations and our pictures. Now we're going to send them a notice of violation. To do that, we come over here under Add and Select Letter. And we're going to send this letter to our property owner. So next to their name, we look at our list. So in this section is where we're going to load all your forms and letters. So if you've got a separate notice for vehicles or a separate notice for weeds, you can keep them as separate. You can make them as one that incorporates all of those documents. It just kind of depends on how you want to set it up. But as part of your setup, we get all those notices. We plug them in. You can change them whenever you want to. I'm just going to choose this violation letter. And let me pull this over here. This letter template, we've set it up to print the photos. So because it's got photos embedded in it, it asks us which pictures do you want to select. Sometimes you'll take 50 pictures, but you really only want to put two on there. This gives you the option to just select some of them. I'll select those, click Finish, and now I'm going to generate my letter. This goes out and grabs my template, grabs all my data, and pulls it into this letter. And so here's just an example. And this is the one where it's pulled in all three of our violations. It's got our weeds, it's got our wrecked vehicle, and it's got our rodents. It'll put in the full ordinance text right here. And if we wanted to add the comments, we can add the comments. If I plugged in a follow-up date, it could print there. So you can control how it prints in here. So if you want to have a different formatting, you can do that. The letters look basically however you want them to look. Um, you can have them auto-signed. And then here's just those photos that I selected. So you can include those in your letters. After I generate this, I can print and mail it. Once I close it, it asks if I want to save a copy. I'll select yes. And then it goes here on our Documents tab. So if I wanted to look at it again in the future, I can just pull it up. So that's an overview of how you get your inspection, you plug in your notes, your photos, violations, send notices, and then schedule your reinspection so it reminds you to go back out in a couple of weeks and check it again. Does that part make sense? Any questions on that? I've got one. We send out everything first class in registered mail. Is there a place to put the registered mail, the number for the green card on there? There is. You can, you can do it through admin. I'll show you just so you can get kind of a feel for how the admin part works. If we said, hey, we need to start making that certified, I can come into our letters. I'm just going to go to our form and letters. Here's all our templates. And in our violation notice, I'm just going to plug in a little field here. So this is like a little word processor. Um, so I'm going to say, you know what, I want to put it right here. 
And what I'm going to add, these are different fields that I can add. Now, you can do this. We can do it for you, too. So if you don't want to go on here and play with this stuff, you just say, hey, Julie, will you change this for me? And we'll change it. So I'm going to put in a text field. And I'll plug it in right there. And I want to call it certified mail number. I'll save our template. So now the next time anyone generates that, you would just do this one time. So now the next time anyone generates that, let me go find my file again here. Back, 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 back. back. OK. So I'm going to say add letter. Choose our violation letter. And it pops up this little window. Enter your certified mail number. So you can do that with any different kinds of fields. Normally, we pull the data from um, within the case file. But the certified mail number is a good one that it's just easier to ask you at the time you're generating it, because you've got that little paper there. And it just makes sense to plug it in at that point. So then when you generate it, oh, I didn't save a copy, but it will plug in right there. You can also edit your letters. So if you wanted to modify the template just for this particular um, letter, you can, when you go to generate it, you click the edit icon. It'll pull up that letter editor. And you could type in notes just for this particular case. Any other questions on kind of the inspection side of things? I'm, I'm curious about the uh, mapping interface. Um, OK. All right. Um, what, what I'm curious about is it looked like you had a Google Maps um, kind of uh, plug in there or something that you put into it. And uh, it said that there were zoning and some other overlays that would be pertinent to the work. Um, uh -huh. how, do those, how do those interface with our enterprise database? And do any of the address points get to, uh, do those get performed in our database? Or is this all external? I think I caught most of what you said. We do use Google Maps. You're right. Um, what we do as far as your layers that you'd like to see incorporated within CitizenServe is we um, get a KMZ file from you, and then we'll load those layers so that you can, you know, if you want to see council districts or inspection areas or whatever your different layers might be, we can load as many of those as you want. Um, if I, let me pull this up here. So here's the map again. Like I said, it's Google Maps. I said, you know what, I just want to look at my inspections. Um, you can pull that up, put little pinpoints wherever you have inspections. You can, like I said, show the different layers that you've got. Um, was there anything else in there? I didn't quite hear all of your questions. Um, well, does, does this interface with our database, could it be, could it be used to interface with our database? We've got um, an RTIS server um, instance running. And uh, we've got all of our data, or can put whatever data on that, that would be necessary. Uh, but typically, no what, typically what we do is we'll do an export of the data monthly, however often. So we'll, we'll basically get a download of your data and load it into the system. If you'd want to create a, de a direct connection or integration, we can do that. There's just a separate fee you know, for the actual integration components. But the, the monthly, you know, upload, download kind of process, there's no charge for that. Okay. And then uh, do, how do the, uh, the address points get saved? Are they external, or can we get that information? Um, you know, as like, a, as like a layer file or something? You mean when, we, when you want information out of CitizenServe back, or? Um. Or the actual ownership information? Um, just any of the data that's generated in here, like case by location. Yeah, case by location. Like if, if we wanted to uh, do you know, analysis on it later or something. You can create like reports within CitizenServe that have the different data that you want. If it's like a one-off sort of thing, then normally it would be a report that you would just you know create and run, and it would export that data. If it's something that you want on a, you know, you want a list of all the open cases every month so that you can put them on a map that the whole city can see, we can create processes for those so that, you know, you can run those every month and have the data either sent over in a batch file, or if you want direct integration, again, we could do that. Most people just do a batch because it's not something that has to be done real time, typically. Okay, thank you. 
I have a, um, I guess a more a related question. In our uh, proactive rental inspection program, we mm -hmm. found that we're entering, uh, we have a, we've created a separate spreadsheet where we have a lot of multiple address points that are related to a particular parcel number. Okay. Is that something that we can actually add in those address points and open so that I can, let's say I have, uh, I have uh, 600 West Street, apartments A through H. Mm -hmm. um, can I then add in address points for that parcel ID and then have them show up? In other words, then I could, I could search either on 600 West Street or I could search on 600 C West Street. You can. And the way we kind of handle that multiple property situation within a file. If I pull this up and our address is 109, I don't know how you say that, Sioma, but <laughs> if I want to add additional addresses, so let's say this is a duplex and, and we want to call it one file because it's one parcel number, but it is two addresses. I can come in here and say, okay, well, we've got 109, Unit A and 109, Unit B. So when I save that, now this file has now got two individual addresses. So the way okay. you can count that can vary. I mean, if you want to count it as, um, it just kind of depends on your reports. It's one file because it's easier for the inspector. And when you do your violations, so when I, if I added a violation, I can say, um, well, this violation just goes on unit A. So you can plug in your violations and say, this one's just for unit A, or this is a common area that goes to the main address, or this happened in all three of these apartments. So it makes it easier for your inspectors to do one inspection, but have it applied to those multiple addresses when it's um, appropriate. OK, so it would, it would operate as a single file, but there would be the option for multiple addresses. That's how most people do it. Some people will have it be a separate file, but most people, what they, how they look at it is parcel number. So if it's a parcel, they call it one file, and then they say, here's all the different addresses. So if it's a, if it's a 200 unit apartment building that's over three parcels, they'll usually make it three files, and you don't, you could still make it one. But most people want that parcel number is kind of the key factor because then it's easy to decide. Do I make this one or do I make this two or three? Okay. That, that part is user generated. We would enter that and then once it's entered, it's in there. Right. Okay. Um, I also had a... Um, uh, no, I didn't. Got answer. Sorry. Oh, I did have a question. Where are uh, photographs stored, or are you going to um, address that in detail later? Where is what stored? Where are the photographs stored? The photographs are stored in our database, and our database is here in Phoenix. So they're just, you know, they're not separate files. They're in the database as a field in the database. So when the database gets backed up, all the images get backed up, all the letters, everything is all one piece. Okay, so we would not need a separate storage location for photographs. No, you would not. Can you back up your storage of those photographs to an off-site location from where you're at now? Or is it just in that one location where you're at? Do you I didn't quite hear that. Mm -mm. She was curious about if you do backup of the photos, where they are stored. Because they're stored in the database, we used to have them as a separate file. We, we used to, years and years ago, they were saved as files on a separate server in our data center. And what we found was that it was difficult to treat them separately. If you were doing a restore, how do you know which files were there at the time you're doing your database restore? So we put them in the database so they're all one thing. If we had to restore the database, it would go back to the point in time you know, the images, the doc, everything in there is all going to be in one central location. So they're tied together. What 
What was that? If you have a fire, then that storage can be curious about a fire in your location. Oh, we have uh, off-site storage as well. So we do nightly full backups, and then we do backups every 15 minutes that are shipped to a separate facility. That was our question. Thank you. Another question: When you're talking about looking up case history, is it from this point on, or will we be able to look at older case history? Did you well, we're going to migrate your. I got that. We're going to migrate your data, so you'll be able to see everything from your previous system, your current system, to now. Well, we don't ever archive anything or delete things unless you delete them. I mean, you'll see everything in there. So what would happen to the pictures and stuff of our old cases? We'll write a program to take them and convert them from files into our database. So they'll, they won't be files anymore. We'll take the files, we'll identify how do we attach them to a, a file number, and then we write programs to import them and put them. So they'll work just like any other document. You won't really know that they used to be a file on a server somewhere. They'll be embedded in this documents tab. Okay. All right. Julie, I do have one more question. Um, in regards to that free program that uh, um, Craig just mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. if, does this thing actually, um, what should I say, com it's compatible with something like, let's say, Excel, correct? Um, oh, I the mean, reason, the reason okay. I'm asking that is that we got a, a lot, a large amount of data that we have already collected uh, in regards to this program. So, will we be able to salvage at least? most of this information, you know, so that we don't have to enter all that data in. Um, yeah. But the parcels that we were talking about. Yeah. As part of, as part of the, um, you know, our contracts together, we're going to do your data migration. So, and, and exactly what you're going to get out of that is hard to say until we look at it. But typically we can pull everything out. The only time we run into issues is if, Let's say you're using a spreadsheet, and in one cell you type in all your inspections, and you kind of plug everything in there, dates and comments and everything. It's hard to split that out. But if it's a spreadsheet where you've got a column for file number, and a column for address, and a column for this, it's pretty easy to import. And the, the way that we do your data migration is while we're doing your setup, we work on the migration programs, we migrate the data, we import into the system, and then you can look at it. And we do that kind of through training and setup. So you'll be able to see everything in there. You'll be able to make sure it came across correctly. We didn't miss anything. We didn't lose anything. And then once you're happy with that migration, and right before you go live, we run it all again so we get your current information. <coughs> Could you expand on the uh, iPhone app a little bit? Um, how, does, how does that work compared to this? Or I, well, the I the iPad, it's not a separate app. It's you, you, you access Citizen Serve through Safari on the iPad. There's a separate app that you do have to install that lets you attach those documents because you can't, the iPad doesn't let you, you know, pull files from your iPad. So there's a separate app, but it's seamless. Once you load it, you don't really even know that it's happening. Um, so it works just like everything we've done. So if you're at the desk, it's going to work the same way as it's going to work if you're on your iPad. Okay, so it's like a, you just access the web application. Yeah, you're not going to have to learn a separate thing. It's not going to work differently. It's the exact same thing. The only difference is you have to load this iPad app so that you can attach and take your photos. So you can take your photos on the iPad and attach them directly from that. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Earlier, okay. when you were doing some violations, uh, doing the letter, you showed three different violations, and one of them was the old rusty pickup truck. Um, it didn't show where you put the VIN number, and we also had to send a letter to the register owner of the vehicle, even if they don't live at that address. So the, um, when you pulled up your letter, all those were going to go to that address for that register owner. But if you got a vehicle, you got to send it to the register owner. You could have a separate letter. So when I'm in here and I go to add letter, um, you know, you can have a separate letter that's vehicle notice and you can send it to someone else. And typically what people will do 
when they have vehicles is they'll um, set up a, a custom custom field. So they might have an activity called you know vehicle, and then down here we'll create fields for license number, VIN, you know that kind of stuff. So that you can plug it in here, and then it'll be printed on your on your letter. So in other words, you're going to generate. The, the field to select in order to, to enter the information related to the vehicle, right? Right. So you create a template, and we just simply use the drop down menus, I guess, to, to select right. next okay. Right. And then we just say, OK, on, on the vehicle letters, we're only going to pull the vehicle violations. On the other letters, we're going to pull the letter the violations, but not the vehicle. So if you had a combo, you. you wouldn't pull them on both. Yes, yeah, so, so those letters can be any length that we need them to be, uh, because usually along with the violation and the citation of the ordinance, we explain what the code enforcement process is for that particular case. So we can actually make that, whatever that is, part of the letter, correct? You can, and what people typically do with it is in, um, in our violation sort of maintenance table, we have what's the code, the short description, the full description, and the corrective action. So within, and these two fields get really big, so you can put a lot of information in there. So if it's, if the process is specific to that violation, like you have to clean it up within 14 days and here's a possible fine if you don't, then we usually tie it to the violation. If it's more of an overall general thing, then we plug that in the template of the letter. So it just kind of depends on, usually what we do is we look at your current letters and your current violations and it helps us understand you know, how you're doing it now, what may, might be the best approach, but you can always change it, too. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. Going back to the PRIP program, um, you sent out the first letter, and the time expired, and the time for reinspection to occur, does, the, um, does it automatically tell us that that day covers? or you have to set up our reinspection, and if that inspection fails and we have to send out our second set of letters, you know, will that also keep in line to give us our next 30 days of when the following inspection has to come? You can do it a couple of different ways. What, what I see most of our customers do is most of the violations are usually about a two-week period. So typically what they'll do is in the body of their letter and not in each violation, they'll say you have you know, 14 days from the date of this letter. If, if that's pretty standard, then you can kind of just use that across the board. If your violations are different all the time, like some of them are two weeks and some of them are two days and some of them are something else, you can use this follow-up date so that you can print a specific date next to each violation and it'll schedule your reinspections automatically for you based on the date that you enter in the follow-up. So you can kind of go two ways. The, the, the follow-up date gives you more flexibility, but it's a little more entry just because you have to kind of think about each violation and when am I going to go back and that kind of thing. If your ordinances are written in such a way that, you know, for the majority of the cases, two weeks is typical, then, then usually that's the better way to set it up because it's a more standard and it just sort of follows that same process flow throughout. But you can go either way. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, it's based on code. Can you tie it to the code? Could, could you, Julie, could you tie it to the code? You could tie it to the code through, um, oh, that's not what I wanted to click. We can put it in here so we can say, you know, we can use some of these fields, and not specifically for that, but we could use some of these fields to say what's the date and then have it pull, you know, those dates from that. So there's some configuration options we could do to kind of customize it if, you know, you have different. Like, for instance, our vehicles is 10 days, our weedy lots are something like, I'm sorry, the, the vehicles are 7 days, the weedy mm -hmm. lots are 10 days. Can we make it a default that it needs, it's going to calculate 10 days from the day about that? We could it's do fine. that through, yeah, we could. We do it through the, the letter generation. You can add special functionality when you generate your letter. So we do it from the point that, hey, once you click the letter, that's when we'll add this logic to go, well, how many days? And so schedule the inspection from that and fill out the date on the letter. So yeah, we could. Can we do that, or you have to do that? So we, have to we would write, you would configure the days through administration. We would configure 
you know, the logic that say, based on the date that you've entered here, have it, you know, plug in these inspections. So I have one more question. Okay. This will be the last one he asked. Okay. <laughs> So is it going to bring up the, you know, when we pull up that case, is it going to bring up the property owner with their telephone number and all that? Right. Julie, he was late getting here. I don't think he fell asleep at the beginning of your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> he was late getting here, so. It will automatically show you, okay, here's our owner, here's their address. If we had a phone for them, that would show up. The history tab kind of gives you the information at a high level. What is this about? Where is it? Who's the owner? What are our notes? So the history tab gives you kind of that general information. Each of these individual tabs give you details about those. So activities is going to show me all my inspections. Documents is going to show me all the pictures or letters I've sent. You know, violations is going to show all the, and this is all on this particular address and file. So when I'm on this page, everything I'm looking at is about this particular file. Thank you. I have a question. Okay. No, 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 no. no go ahead. I, I like questions. Okay. You know, uh, was talking about an interface with Outlook. So how do we send these follow-ups, these dates, these events to our Outlook calendar? We don't, we don't integrate with Outlook. And, and the reason for that is it doesn't really work well for code inspections because if you wanted to go today and you got stuck in some meeting and you didn't make it, I mean, code inspections are much more fluid typically. They don't always happen on the exact date. So you don't really want them on a calendar because if you didn't do it yesterday, now you have to go move it all around or you forget about it. So we don't, we don't do integration with Outlook calendars. Your inspections show up here under your My Tasks. And they okay. stay there until you've done them. So if you have this one here for three months, it'll stay there until you get to it. Okay. Uh, Julie, I have a question about uh, letters. Uh, okay. I'm assuming that the letters that we're trying to go more and more paperless, uh, okay. or as paperless as we can get. So I'm assuming that uh, if a letter is sent, then there is a history record of that specific letter and what it looks like that we could pull back up. There is. So here, it's going to be on the Documents tab. It's going to tell you who sent it on what date. And if you want to look at it, you just click it. Okay. You get a copy of that letter. And then, and if you uh, one of the things that uh, obsesses us a great deal is whether or not we have service on a letter. So we'll send a certified and a first class. If the first class is returned, then we do not have service, and then we also track whether the certified green cards come back. Is there a, a way to, is there a tracking system in this program, or can we add a tracking system? We, what I would do in that example is I would um, recommend setting up a separate custom activity. So I would hit Add Activity, and then my activity type might be um, whatever the notice is. And then if you see here, like if I choose different things, these fields change down here. So we would set up custom fields, like certified mail number. You type this in here, and then you can have a status returned, and you know, whatever those different statuses are, so that you can track it based on what was that original notice date. Okay. You could run reports on how many didn't come back or how many we're waiting on, that kind of stuff. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. My question is, if I have to do 850 inspections a year, how, is, how do you track that by inspector? Well, all of your activities, once you enter them, they're tied to your name. So we know who, you, who did it, what date, where do you go, we know everything. So through reporting, you can pull anything, pretty much. As long as you're typing it in there, you can run a report on it. So you can create reports that just show how many inspections did so-and-so do in a quarter, in a month, in a week, how many inspections versus re-inspections, how many inspections turned into a notice of violation, how many inspections didn't. You know, I mean, you can, the possibilities are really endless. 
Oh, is that on our system now? It's, it's either my name or somebody else's name. It means in case it's transferred and there's no way to track it. So under that username, does it? So if I go out and do an initial inspection and another inspector does a reinspection, how is it? Is it unique? It's it is unique. So if I put a reinspection and you were vacationing, you know, in the south of France or something, and so we were going to schedule this one to Justin, we can see, all right, Justin did this one, but Damon did these two. And you, you also tie a person to the case. So in general, Damon is taking care of this file. Doesn't mean that anyone else can't work on it. If Justin needs to do an inspection, he can. But, you know, we put one person's name as a person who's generally working this case, and they'll generally have these inspections, but other people can do it as well. You can say how many inspections I did per week, per area that, I, that I'm working in? Like yep. if I'm working in per area? You can, as long as we're tracking the area, we could, yeah, absolutely. We want to see reports. You want to see reports. Okay, so let's go to reports. So in reports, there's all kinds of uh, options. There's some standard reports. All of these are standard reports, and you know they're okay. They're not. They're okay. They're not the best. But really, what's the best is the custom reports. So through custom reports, you have three different options. A custom report is something that we create for you. And you can have as many of these as you want. These are when you have more complicated reports. You, they have to have a certain format. <clears throat> they have to have certain data. Or you just don't feel like writing it yourself. We can create these for you. Again, there's no limit. Um, if you ask us to do a report for you, they're usually done on the same day. Um, so it's a quick, easy way to get kind of whatever you want. There's a report wizard, which you can use whenever you want. Um, and I'll kind of walk you through that. So I'm going to go to the Advanced Report Wizard. And so anyone can come in here and um, create their own reports. So you have different options. You have a detail, which is just going to be a list. Give me a list of information. Your next option is a detail with summary, which is a list, but it'll give you like group counts within there. And then summary is more like a, a matrix. You know, show me all the numbers of these. I'll do a detail and summary for today. And we'll click Next. The next thing it asks you is, well, what information do you want to report on? These are kind of all the combinations of data that you might want to report on. So what's typically difficult about writing reports is that people don't always understand how the tables are related, and they don't really know how to connect things together. So this does that for you. So if I said, you know what, I want to look at um, files and violations. That's what I'm interested in. I'll click Next. And then these are all the fields on those combinations of tables that I can plug into my report. So let's say I want file number, status, open date, close date, address, um, I don't know, violation, short description. Got my fields in there. Click Next. I can change the order. So if I want this to go up at the top, I can change the order as I want. Click Next again. And here's where I plug in my criteria. So let's say, you know, I just want to see a list of everything opened within a certain range. So I'm going to say open date is greater than January 1st of this year, and open date is less than 9-1 um, for this year. You can put as much criteria in here as you want. So I'll start with that. Click Next. And because I'm doing a summary, it's saying, all right, well, how do you want to summarize this? So if I said, you know what, I want it summarized by the violations. And I want to have a, a sum. I want to count by all those violations. I click that and then just hit Finish. And it runs out and does my report for me. So in this example, it's grouped it by, you know, here's one violation, cats and dogs. If I come down in here to weeds, we'll see more weeds. So here's a sample of a custom report that you can create yourself. Um, you can save it. You can export it to a spreadsheet. You can export it to a PDF. If I save it. It's just going to, let me drag this over here. It's going to say, well, what do you want to call your report? And I'm going to call it, I don't know, my Julie report. And I'll save it. And then it's going to go here under your whatever report you saved it in. So you can pull it back up and run it whenever you want. So you can create as many reports as you want. What the, um, what the custom report, it lets you, I'll show you this one. This is one that I did for um, 
I don't know, somebody in Florida. But it's a crazy report. So let's just run it just to give you an example of when you would use the ones that you write versus when would you ask us to do it. And you can ask us to do it whenever you want. So if you don't like playing in those reports or you don't have time to mess with it, just ask us and we'll do it for you. But this one takes a while because it's, it's just pulling, it's just like their annual dashboard report that pulls information from all over the place. So what, what we find a lot of people doing when they have these sort of you know, reports they have to produce, they have 15 different reports they have to run to get the data that they can plug into their spreadsheet that they have to give to their boss. Through the report writer, we can you know, create that format for you. You give us a spreadsheet of how you have to do it, and we can, we can mirror that. And it's taken forever because it's just a crazy one. And through the reports, you can also, and I'll show you this, you can do uh, mail merges. So you can say, if you're going to send out, let's say, um, annual weedy lot notices, we create a report for you that lists all of the properties that have weeds, and we set up a letter template, and then you run the report, it goes right to the letter. So you can uh, you know, do those batch notices. Okay. So here was an example of, again, this is Florida's. So it just this was sort of their metrics. They wanted to look at it by month. They wanted second quarter total, first quarter year to date. They're doing all these sort of comparisons between this and that. And you know, it's just kind of a crazy report. But it's an example of you don't really have to be limited within reports. We can, we can really create almost anything. As long as the data is in there and it's not like embedded in notes and things like that, you can report on you know, anything that you put in the system. Anything specific on reports? Um, so I, I was listening, but I uh, may have gone over my head. So either we could actually create a, let's say, a template for a monthly report, or we could get you to create a template for a monthly report, and then just go back in and change the parameters like the date range and that sort of thing. Exactly. And, and typically, as part of setup, we get all the reports that you know you need, um, you know, that you're running right now. We set those up for you. But over time, people, as they start using it, they think of more things that they want to report on. So we can, you know, add them, change them as, as needed. Thank you. And now, uh, Julie, I have a question regarding that. How about uh, access control to all of this data and reporting and so on? Uh, do we have control over that, or do you have to set that up yourself? Either way, pretty much everything in the system, you can do it or we can do it for you, depending on what you prefer. So under admin is kind of where you get to all that configuration parts. So if I come over here, I can go into roles. This is sort of the security level. You can create different roles. I'll just pull one up to show you. And so a role has certain rights. So you say, well, they can do this and this and that. And then you assign a user to those roles. So the user I'm logged in right now, I'm in Code Enforcement. I have access to do all this admin stuff in Code Enforcement. But if I go to Business Licensing, I can't get to any of it there because I don't have access. So individual users can have different rights um, within their sections, you know, view only modify, delete, you know, all those are different rights that you can set up. And all the, pretty much all the configuration is over here under the lookups tab. So these are all your drop downs. If you said, oh, we need to add a new violation type, I could come here to violation type and go, all right, I want to call that number of cats. I want to call it, you know, allowed or something. You know, you can come in here and do it or we can do it for you, whichever is easier. The customs is where you can add your custom fields and custom tabs. Um, let me find one I can click. Oh, oh, there's one. Here's a certified mail number. So you can set up as many different types of fields as you want. I mean, they can be calculated. They can be check boxes. They can be drop downs. They can be kept, you know, numbers. There's all kinds of options you can use, you know, within the custom field setting. So you and it really depends. Some of our customers never go to admin. And they ask us to do all of it for them, and some of our customers are heavily involved in it. It just really depends on, you know, your desire and ability and time to do so. Can I ask kind of an off the wall question? 
Chris, you think the data that was created to this and exported to GIS to create a layer showing where the violations are at or by the taxes? You can. We can find one of those reports. But you can create a report that goes to a map. So you run a report, which is just like any list. But instead of it being on a list, it shows it on a map so that you can print it or do whatever you want with it. So you could either export that information to your GIS, or if you wanted to run it and print it in CitizenServe on a map, you could do that as well. I've got a question for you, Julie. Okay. Uh, at the end of our weedy lot process, we send our information to our impact team that does the cutting. Is there okay. any way on here that we could send them the stuff without having to print out all the documents and send to them? Um, typically, what people do is they'll do a report which says, you know, here's the criteria. Find any weeds that we've put fines on it on this date, and they'll run it and um, export it to a spreadsheet, and then just email them the spreadsheet. Okay, so but we've got a, a unique case number, so we could tell them to go on and pull up that case number. Then can they uh, make it part of the history? Do they cut it and and download the pictures right there? Is that possible for them to kind of input that they cut it in the system? Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you give them a user account, then yeah, then you okay. can just assign them an activity so they would log in. And um, it'd be listed, go lock, you know, lock cut, and they'd do it. And once they finished it, they'd, you know, plug in that they'd finished it. Good, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. It would show up in the history then when you open the case file. It would show up uh, right yeah. here. It'd say like lot, lot mo or whatever. Yeah. Okay. They'd pull yeah. it up. They'd mark that they did it. If there's any fees associated with that, we could generate bills. Um, they're not going to be users on the system. You could send them a spreadsheet or, or something along those lines. Um, Julie, I'm assuming that the same thing could be true for any other, uh, like any any uh, legal, paralegal or legal things we do, like uh, uh, if we filed a lien, if we filed a list pendants, if we did a title search, all right. of that stuff could be the same. Okay. All of that could be plugged in. It's just different types of activities. So, so normally what you're going to see along those lines is when you go into the activities tab, you're going to see like title search, you know, lean hearing. You're going to see kind of all of those different things as tasks within this activity list in addition to your inspections. Thank and you. if the list gets long, you can filter here. So if this is something you've been working on for four years and this list has, you know, 100 things, you can say, I'm looking for the, you know, title search, and it'll pop right to that one. So you can find things easily within the file. Julie, mm -hmm. I want to, can you show my tag on the map real quick for me? Yeah. You go here, you click view on a map, it jumped over here, let me drag it over here for you. Let me zoom out. They're up here. So there's my two inspections. So you don't normally get these scroll bars. I just have it all zoomed out so it's bigger for you. Um, but there's our two options. Gives you basic information. If you wanted to input this inspection, you just click right there and you can start plugging in your inspection. And I would, I would to get my inspection. What, what options do you have for filtering and grouping my tags? What was that? What options do you have for filtering and grouping my tasks? So when I'm in here, we the, the tasks are set up to sort of three different things. Mostly as an inspector, you're going to use inspections, and you may use like hearings and things and other activities. If you have different types of inspections, so let's say, this is a good example. I've got inspections, re-inspections, and weedy lots. If I said, you know what, I just want to see the weedy lots I have to get done. I can do that, and it'll just show those. I can say, you know what, I want to see everything in a certain date range because I'm going to go, you know, get everything in this area that's coming up in the next week or so. So you can filter by your inspection types and also by your, by the due dates. Thank 
Animal Any questions? other questions? Can we, go, can we go back to the, I missed the first part of it. So if, if my mouth is still doing an infection with an iPad, uh-huh. Do I you're going to do it. You get, if you're, you, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I have to have internet access to internet because this is a web application, right? That, that's true. With the client cache, be able to get reconnected to that phone. Can you go back to that and just show them quickly, clearly, how that works? How to plug in a new case? Yes. Yeah, if you were to out inspections and you saw one that you want to plug in, you just come here to add and select code compliance. This this section is if someone called it in. So if you're an inspector out in the field, you're going to leave it blank because you, you're it's proactive. So you'll leave that alone. So then you just go to the description and type in what is this about. I don't know. Something like that. Uh, you type in an address. I'll just do one for Baker, see what we have on there. Click search. This shows you all of your addresses. I typed in one four, so it finds everything that starts with that. And let's say it's, I decide it's 141. When I click select all, it pulls in the full address. It pulls in the property owner's name and their mailing address. If we've got their phone number, that comes in, parcel number, and legal description. So all that parcel information automatically comes in. If there were any alerts on this address, this thing would be flashing, a, a bright red and flashing telling you that there was something important you should know. If you click it, you'd see the alert. If there was any history on this address, you'd have another icon here. So uh, there's no icon here. I know that we don't have any other cases open now or ever in the history on this address. Uh, you can select your type. We'll just say code enforcement. You can... Um, in your referral, how received, you could have proactive or inspector initiated or something like that if you're tracking those different types of files. And then the last thing you do is just get the responsible user at that point. Suppose it's defaulting. Okay. It defaults to me, but you can choose somebody else. Okay, so if I get a complaint over the phone, I can start a case for the guy and just put their name in there and it'll show up to, for them. Is that right? That's right. As soon as I hit save, if I say it's due today, it'll show up on their task list today. Okay. And then I just click save. I didn't quite hear that. Julie, if we have inspected my pack, is that the layer that we provided to you? And we show an address within that you know, polygon kind of group, mm -hmm. could it default the responsible inspector? It can default, yes, it can. It could default your inspector if you have uh, like council districts or inspection areas, you know, any of those sorts of fields. If we've got a GIS layer for that, it'll automatically populate those fields tied to that property. Uh, where it has the owner's uh, information at, what if they have, you know, what if they live somewhere else, but they think an agent, you know, here, um, will it pull up their agent or, you know, uh, property management, you know, that we would need to send. Only if we put it in there. You can add another person. So it's like this is a good one. It's a family trust, right? So if I said, you know what, they've got a, a legal agent we need to serve, I'm just going to go to add, contact, and I'll say the agent's name is, I don't know, ABC agent. But Julie, once you do put it in, it will stay there forever and ever and ever. So every time we have a case on that property, it should come up, right? That's one of the options. It's, it doesn't tie it to that property. It ties it to this file. So if I pulled up, for example, let's say that this is the owner and it's ABC Property Management. If I pulled up a file on the same address that was from three years ago, and three years ago it was a different owner and a different management company, I would see who it was at that point in time. 
So your, uh, your cases uh, yeah. don't automatically update ownership. It stays, unless you physically change it, it stays who it was at the point that you added it so that you don't lose that history over time. Right. Is that what is that what it's saying? If we have a new case at the, at the same address six months from now, if we put in that address, we'll pull up the owner and the management company if we put it in there? No, it's only going to pull the owner that's tied to this parcel. I mean, you can still see it. So if we plugged in, let's just change this one. I'm going to say, what if we found out that this wasn't the right owner, and it was, you know, I don't know, Joe Smith. And I save it. And then I go add another one. And the parcel data we have on file is still saying it's that trust. When I plug it in here, what did I say, 140-something? Mm, Baker. So who was I? So it was 141. I'm going to go to 141 just so we can show you what it's going to show. So when I search, it's still saying the owner of record, as far as we know from the, the, the county assessor's data, is saying that this is the owner. But you can look down here at different addresses, and it'll say, oh, I picked the wrong address. It'll say John Smith you know, was updated today. So you might go, oh, you know what, it looks like this one might be more current. I'm going to use this ownership information instead of what we have on the county parcel data. So it kind of gives you both views. Here's what we have on record from the assessor's office, and here's kind of what we know. And you can choose whichever one you want. No, you answer it. Yeah. Julie, if we have uh, two multiple owners listed with the um, county county tax folks, will it mm -hmm. automatically fill both owners? You can do it two ways. You can have it list. Um, you can have it list both of them separately, and you can say, "I just want one," or you can have them tied on the same records showing that there's two owners, and then you pick that one. So we have to decide, do you want to list them as individual people, or do you want to list them as both? And then once we choose that way, that's how it'll work. You'll either pick one, or you'll pick the record that has both of them. But it will pick up both owners. It can, yeah. It'll, it'll know that they're both owners there. When you send the letter, so if I, when I'm sending letters, let me go find a file. Do I have on here? Okay, so I'm going to say add letter. If I wanted it, we wouldn't send our complaint a notice of violation, but we will just so I can show you. If we said, you know what, we want to send it to both of these guys. Oops. It's asking me all my prompts over here. What pictures do I want? I choose it next to both people. So now when I generate, I'm going to get one letter, but there's going to be two pages. The first page is for me, and the second page is for the second person. So you can send it to multiple people, and it just creates a separate copy for each one. So if you had certified mail numbers, you know, you could put a different number on each one. Julie, since y'all been doing this since 2003, have y'all had any crashes with the system? Do we have any what with the system? The system crashed since 2003. Um, we've had a couple. I mean, our, our uptime is more than 99 point something percent, but we've, we've had a couple. I mean, it, it happens occasionally where, you know, the hosting provider loses, you know, connection in some area or something, but it's not very common. And if that we've never lost any data. We've never... Um, you know, how to restore the database to a prior point in time. Nothing like that's happened. Nothing scary. If it happened, how would we know what had what gotten involved and had to be re-put in there? If we, if we had to do a restore, um, well, we would tell you at what point in time the restore happened. And it's, it's 15 minutes, so you know you're going to lose 
somewhere between zero and 15 minutes worth of your data. So we well, could tell you, well, this is the time that we restored back to, and this was your last file number entered or your last whatever entered so that you have a way of looking at what, um, you know, where to start. So the system's back up every 15 minutes? We do log shipping every 15 minutes, which the log shipping, it just takes all the changes from the last 15, you know, from the last time we did it, and it sends it to a remote server, and then every night it does a full database backup. Okay. If we're if we're short on code enforcement officers, do you guys come and do inspections for us? <laughs> <laughs> I have gone on inspections before. <laughs> when I first started doing this, um, we wrote a custom app for the City of Phoenix Code Enforcement Department, and they took me out on inspections, and they took me to all their worst buildings they had, and it was was fun. But I'm sure it's, you know they saved all their good stuff for me that day. Julie, I don't know if you can hear John on that. Is is there a like a management level of the MyCap where uh, a manager, let's say, I could look at multiple CEOs' task lists at the same time, that kind of thing? You, you, there's a couple of ways to do it. If it's something that you're doing a lot, we usually create reports for it because it's just faster and easier. But you can go into the to-do list. So I can say, you know what, I want to see my whole department's to-do list. And I want to look at, you know, maybe I just want to see what inspections. So I can come in here and filter this to see just the inspections. I can say, you know what, I want to look at just a certain inspectors. Look at Justin's. So you can kind of use this to filter it. If it's a report, usually what we see is we see people who say, you know, I want a report that lists all my inspectors, how many inspections they did this week, how many overdues they have, you know, that kind of thing. It looks like you can save this filtered view. So if you took the time to make you, if you like to you, you could hit that save icon and come back and look at your view. Yeah, if I save this, the next time I come back, it'll be right where I left it. I didn't hear that. Can you assign different permission levels? I think you answered that. Yeah, you can. So you can say, you know, these people can view, these people can modify, these people can delete, um, you know, these people can go to admin, these people can run reports. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of different security options that you can set. What was that in regards to reports? Yeah, the, the question was, uh, is there any kind of formal training or support videos, et cetera, to, to help us learn? Right. All of our support and training we do online. It's, it's usually in small groups. It can be one-on-one -on -one if that's easier. And really the way, we don't have a, a lot of um, documentation because the documentation is very specific to each person's setup. So if I gave you general help, it probably wouldn't help that much because you're looking for something in related to your setup and your process. So we do lots of online training. You can schedule additional training whenever you want. If you want to create a report and you can't figure it out, you can say, can you help me? And we can just jump on a web conference and we'll walk through it with you. So it's very kind of on demand as you need it. We'll do additional training or help using web conferences, um, you know, and phone support. Thank you. Um, Julie, with the PRIP program, what the uh, model that we're currently using, we uh, select a certain number of uh, properties and we assign a specific uh, inspection date, date and time range. So we'll inspect uh, for one inspector inspect four properties during the nine to ten thirty time period on X day, whatever the day is. 
Right. Um, can we use this to do that? In other words, uh, we, we're not actually creating a case for that property, and yet we do want to record the activities on that property. You have to have, within citizen service, you have to have a case to, to have activities. A property is just a property with its own elements, like zoning and inspection area and stuff like that. So you have to create a case, but you could set up a different type of case. What What is this for? What types of inspections are these? <coughs> Proactive rental inspections. OK, so you say go out in this area and just target some some areas. You could create, I mean, I guess we'd have to kind of consider it, but you could create um, one file. So one file that's called proactive. And then you know you just add all your addresses in it. We'd have to kind of play with that and decide what's the best way to go. But you could also just create the type could be proactive. And that way you're segregating it. You don't have to count on your other reports if you don't want to, you know, all that kind of stuff. OK, so, so maybe it would be. We could open a case, but we would have a different designation for it until it actually became uh, an enforcement case. So maybe, maybe we'd call it something else. Yeah. Yeah, so enforcement a, versus proactive, yeah. Case or something. Okay. Yeah. And, and then you can, through the reporting process, you can create up those scheduling batches. So you know, we create a parameter. You say, I want this many inspections, this date. I want this many per day. You know, and then it can go run and schedule those for you. Uh, this is assuming I'm John 